Okay, hello everybody. Welcome to our series continuing on virtual connects. This one is about what architects need to know about the 2020 elections. We've got a primary preview and then a look ahead to the fall and easy ways for the architecture community to get involved in what's happening with politics across our state. We've got a great panel today of people who have helped us out in a variety of ways to make sure that the architecture profession is relevant and um, a continuing source of information and solutions to our people who run for public office. As always, you'll get one learning unit for participating today. And we ask you to use the Q&A functions to function at the bottom of your Zoom bar to submit questions to the panel. Uh, we'll have time at the end for you to um, ask those questions and get those answers. Our panel today is four distinguished colleagues um, who have done great work to help advance the profession. Uh, we have two slash three members and one lobbyist. Um, and that's an honorary member, so we kind of count him as well. The first panelist I'll introduce is Aaron Bronstein. Hello, Aaron. Hi. Aaron's a senior architect at Davis Partnership. She references a depth of design experience in Colorado and Western State projects, working in schools, indoor aquatic recreation facilities, office construction, and adaptive reuse of existing facilities. Erin's passionate about expanding wellness with high-performing sustainable design. She became the first of Davis Partnership staff to earn the well-accredited professional credential. She's in her second year chairing the Colorado Architecture Advocates Network. Next, we have Amy Graves. Hello, Amy. Hello. Amy was born and raised in Michigan and knew from an early age she wanted to be an architect. After architecture school, she lived and worked in Chicago for over 20 years as an architect in small and large firms, working on projects ranging from single family residential to high rise condominium and mixed use buildings. Several years ago, she decided she needed a change of scenery and moved to Colorado. Welcome. <laughs> Currently, she worked as an architect and project manager at Crane Architecture in Denver. And Jerry Johnson, honorary at Colorado. Hello, Jerry. Hi, Mike. Jerry's representative of architects at the state capitol since he was hired by AI Colorado in 1982. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> the interview process conducted by uh, names many of you know, Phil Giro, D.A. Bertram, and Marvin Sparn. During that time, he has helped the organization and its members build great relationships with members of the General Assembly. At the capitol, he's known for his professionalism and hard work. He's one of the top fundraisers for legislative candidates and he helped AIA Colorado start its first political action committee. Jerry's a former university administrator, holds degrees from Illinois State University and the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign, Oski Bow Wow. He and his wife, Mary, live in Denver and are the parents of two children and five grandchildren. Thanks, Jerry, for joining us. And finally, a man who needs the most limited of <laughs> Nick Remus, our advocacy engagement director for AIA Colorado. Hi, Nick. Hello. Okay, that's our lineup today, and I'll turn it over to Erin to get us started. Excellent. Yes, so the Colorado primaries are upon us. Uh, primaries occur in six days, Tuesday, June 30th. Due to COVID-19, uh, the in-person voting will not be uh, widely available, so mail-in ballots are being sent to all registered voters. You should have already received your ballot in the mail. The deadline to return your ballot is Tuesday, June 30th by 7 p.m. Um, I believe many people have received a message that it's a little late to mail it, so uh, look for your county's drop box locations. Um, the Colorado Secretary, Sec Secretary of State has, should have a link to your county's um, site. If you are registered as an unaffiliated voter, you will receive a de Democratic and Republican ballot. Pick only one ballot to return. If both ballots are returned, neither will be counted. If you are registered to vote but have recently moved, be sure to update your address online. If you're not registered to vote, register to vote. It can be done online in under two minutes. For newly registered voters, however, the deadline to request a ballot was uh, this past Monday, uh, but you will be, be ready for the November election when you do so. So uh, I think next on our agenda, um, we're looking at um, election results as they affect architects. 
Nick. All right. So, um, you know, the, the, the really important question here is why, why should architects care about the election uh, in particular? I hope that everyone cares about elections, period. But there are a lot of issues that do specifically affect the profession. Um, and so um, I'm not going to go through all these, but there's a few important highlights. On the top Colorado legislative issues, I've bolded the first three. Professional licensing, contracts, liability, and tort practice of architecture and firm management. So no matter what, where you are on the political spectrum, no matter how much you care about politics in general or not, um, you know, us as architects uh, doing business in Colorado, uh, these are three issues that are very uh, important. Um, and so we need to be active to be able to um, you know, protect our license, um, protect our members from lawsuits, and to protect our businesses to make sure that, you know, we can run successful businesses. So those are kind of the big three that are going to affect us um, no matter what. Uh, but there's a lot of other issues we see regularly. Construction defects is kind of in that uh, liability and tort category, but it's been a big deal here in Colorado. So we've seen a lot of bills um, that, that, uh, that are on that subject specifically. We track sustainability bills. We look at the way the state funds uh, capital construction and, and rules on um, you know pursuing projects and project delivery methods. So these are these are like really important issues that we have to make sure we have a voice uh, on. Um, otherwise, you know, decisions are going to be made without us, and we're still going to have to follow the rules that someone else uh, comes up with. Um, and on the right on the right side, you see a lot of other issues that. Um, uh, we try to track um, whether or not they are uh, at the top of the priority list in any given legislative session kind of varies, um, but these are important issues to us that we know we want to track and stay on top of, and uh, we do often take positions on these. And um, next week, uh, at the same time, we are going to go into detail on what happened during the 2020 legislative session. So uh, if you're interested in learning any more about any of these categories, uh, this is going to come up again next week, and I'll talk about what uh, actually happened in the legislature this year. All right. Amy's going to talk uh, about uh, that primary ballot now. Yep. I'm requesting control, Nick. There you go. All right. I think I have it. Okay. So your primary ballot. Um, first up, let me go back one slide. Sorry about that. You have United States House of Representative races and U.S. Senate races. Um, and for Colorado, has seven districts for the U.S. House Representatives. Um, we have incumbents running for re-election in all of them. And right now, District 3 has a contested Democratic primary um, to decide who will run against the incumbent Republican. On the U.S. Senate side, as you know, each state has two senators. Um, Cory Gardner is our current senator up for re-election. And he is, um, will be running against, well, we'll find out with the primary results. Um, our contested Democratic primary is between former Governor John Hinkenlooper and former um, Colorado House Speaker Andrew Romanoff, and I'm sure you got everyone has seen ads for both of these gentlemen so far. I think next, uh, most important for our primary ballot are the Colorado House and Senate races. For the Colorado House, um, the state has 65 districts with elections every two years in those districts. This year, there are 13 open seats and um, in a second, I'll let Jerry chime in on some of these primary races. On the Colorado Senate side, there are 35 districts um, with elections, <clears throat> excuse me, half the, in half the districts every four years. So this year we have 18 um, elections happening in the state Senate side with seven open seats and again, some contested primaries. Um, because it's important uh, for architects what happens at the state level Jerry, do you have any insight or predictions or um, you know, kind of hot topics that we'll see in these races for the House or Senate? Amy, I do. <laughs> Great. So the, the cynical French have an expression, plus ça change, plus c'est la même chose, which means the more things change, the more they remain the same. 
as we approach the primary in just one week and the 2020 general election four months later, it's always interesting to be uh, on the upcoming elections and noodle out how we think they're going to play out. As background, I should disclose that I have met virtually, no pun intended, all of the candidates I'm going to talk about. My MO, MO is to be the first lobbyist that future legislators get to know. Meeting, interviewing, fundraising for hopefully the winners before they are elected. As Colorado has morphed from a red state to a purple state to a blue state, aided by the in-migration from both coasts, especially from recent college graduates wanting to join the vibrant Colorado economy, and abetted by incomprehensible tweets from the Oval Office, I can predict with almost absolute certainty that the Colorado legislature will remain the same blue. The current members, the current numbers to spur your uh, recollection are that Democrats control the Senate by a 1916 margin and Democrats control the State House of Representatives by a 4124 margin. And of course, Jared Polis is the governor, also a Democrat. Mm -hmm. So the Senate is the real battleground because a two vote flip there means that Republicans once again control the state Senate. Senate Republican leaders are targeting two races to flip and one race to hold. Senator Jeff Bridges Many of you who've been around a while know him as Rutt Bridges' son. Rutt, a famous uh, both entrepreneur and a contributor to good causes in Denver. His website, Jeff's website, in my opinion, is the best of all state legislators. He represents a district in Greenwood Village near the, or part of the Denver uh, tech center area. And the second race, Rachel Zenzinger, a JBC member and popular moderate Democrat who re represents set the Senate district that encompasses both Arvada and the Jeffco half of Westminster. The odds of beating either of these popular Democrats is zero to none. <laughs> <laughs> Republicans are also focused on holding the seat in Centennial, currently held by Jack Tate, one of our champions, as you know. That race between Democrat Chris Coker, a uh, financial advisor, and lawyer uh, Republican Suzanne Stayert, a former Deputy Secretary of State, is too close to call. The district has a strong Republican registration, uh, but the anti-Trump mood, mood in the suburbs is pretty intense. In the House, where Democrats hold a 17-vote margin, the Republicans would have to flip nine seats to take control, and they do not believe, and even they do not believe that is possible. Mm, okay. However, the most interesting race is the one where I think the Democrats can pick up a House seat. That's in the uh, House district around Littleton, where Richard Champion was appointed by a vacancy committee as late as February this year, a retired oil and gas guy. And he's facing a tough challenge from two Democrats in a primary, but the winner will be a um, paraplegic a uh, former Air Force pilot whose plane, uh, whose helicopter was shot down, uh, David Ortiz, who's a very able, smart uh, advocate for veterans groups, and he's very popular at the Capitol. In addition, we'll be paying attention to a number of primaries that will be decided in a week. 
Weld County has a Senate race and three House primary races that are battles for the heart and minds of the Republican Party. In each, you've got a moderate candidate, more moderate candidate uh, in the Republican uh, primary and a more conservative Democrat. A lot of soft money is going into those, both of those uh, from on both sides in each race. Uh, and it'll be interesting to see how they come out. Representative Donald Valdez from the San Luis Valley has got a primary. He's an incumbent. Representative Colin Larson, uh, an incumbent Republican in Littleton has a primary. He's actually being challenged by the folks who run the Colorado Gun Owners Association. And his, uh, can, his opponent is Justin Everett, a former legislator, famously referred to as Justin Everett because he votes no on virtually uh, every bill. House District 6 in Denver has a three-way primary with three lawyers uh, competing for the former House seat held by uh, Chris Holbert and, or Chris Hansen. And last, I want to highlight, drum roll please, is <laughs> one of our best friends in the General Assembly. Uh, you will be hearing about him, about AI's relationship with him uh, a little bit later in this presentation, but his name is Senator Chris Hansen. Hansen is being challenged in a primary by a political newcomer. I can tell you that during my tenure lobbying the General Assembly for Architects, Hansen is the only member with an undergraduate degree in nuclear engineering, a master's from MIT, and a doctorate from Oxford. State Senate District 31 in Denver cuts a swath in the east central part of the city and includes Wash Park, Gray, Cherry Creek, Hilltop, and Lowry. If you live in this district, I hope you will make every effort to vote. You can vote in this primary if you are a Democrat or if you are an unaffiliated voter and you choose the Democrat ballot from the two that are lying right now on your kitchen counter. The important point is that none of these primary races will change the makeup of the state legislature because they are played out in solid Democrat or solid Republican districts and the primary is the election. So I think I will stop there, Amy. That's really the presidential race and the US Senate battle between Cory Gardner and either Andy or John Hickenlooper will have an influence also in what goes on on down ballot races. Great, thanks, Jerry. It sounds like we'll have to get back to you um, before the November election to uh, <laughs> get more insight. Very helpful. Um, sorry, I'm just requesting control again. I just have a few more things to go over on the primary ballot. Sorry, thought I had it going here. No, uh, no, it says I have control. There we go. All right, so here we go. Um, on your ballot, you'll also find races for the Colorado State Board of Education. This is a public education. Um, it's a seven member board and those members represent the seven districts that match up with the US House. Um, right now there's a um, Democratic majority of four to three. The other race you'll see is for Colorado State Board of Regents. Um, this is uh, for University of Colorado. Uh, this is a nine member board. Um, seven districts, again, match the US House and then there's two at large seats. Um, we've lifted, listed here where we have the open seats and the uh, contests that are being run. Um, we don't, as AIA Colorado, don't really track these too much, but it is important for you to um, research these candidates if they're in your district uh, to make an informed decision. Let me see if it moves. 
I don't know. There we go. Okay, finally, <laughs> what you'll see, there's a lot of local races on your ballot. Um, district attorney, one of them for 22 judicial districts will show up. Also, um, local government races, depending on the county that you live in. So again, we don't track these directly, but um, it is important to just go on Google, research some of these candidates so that, again, you can make an informed decision. And then we'll transition over to what to expect on the November ballot. There we go. So November ballot will hold everything I just talked about for the primary ballot, including those um, races that Jerry talked about for Colorado House and State Senate. And then um, additional races, I think I can turn it back over to Nick and he can run through that information for everyone. Yep. So, uh, of course, the elephant in the room is uh, that we have a presidential election in 2020. Um, I'm not going to go into great detail on that today. Um, it's, we know it's a polarized election. Um, I suspect anyone who's attending uh, this session has an opinion on it already. Um, so uh, I think uh, that we don't need to go into great detail there. Um, a couple other things that uh, I do want members to be aware of, though, is that um, every, every two years, uh, Colorado ballots will include judicial retention races. Um, it just so happens that in Colorado that um, after a judge has been put um, in on a particular court, um, they have to get reapproved um, for subsequent terms. Um, uh, unfortunately, there's not a lot of good information on that, um, but I can share with everyone um, that there does exist a website to, to figure out if you should vote to retain a judge or boot them. Um, it is uh, coloradojudicialperformance.gov, and I can put that into the chat in just a moment. Um, but basically, um, it's not up for 2020 yet because it's still a little early. But if you go to a year, um, you can go to um, whichever race you want, and you can just see if uh, there is an official recommendation to keep or remove a judge. Um, I will say that it's very, very rare for a judge not to be recommended to be um, reelected. Um, back in 2018, I think there were two judges that did not meet performance standards, uh, one in El Paso, and I don't recall where the other one was. Um, but this is, you know, this is kind of how the system works in Colorado for looking at all those judicial races that are at the bottom of your ballot. Um, uh, you know, is, is it the end of the world if you aren't sure how to vote on these? No, it's not. Um, but uh, it only takes a moment to do the research just to see uh, if they've met their performance standards. Um, the other item I want to go into more is um, state ballot initiatives. Let me get back to that real quick. All right, so um, these uh, can any, any uh, citizen in Colorado can decide they want to try to get something on a November ballot. And um, presidential election years are popular times to for certain initiatives to types to get a uh, run, uh, knowing that there's going to be a high turnout all around. Um, so right now, we know for sure there's going to be uh, seven issues on the November 2020 ballot. I'm not gonna go into all of them in detail, but I do wanna hit some highlights. Um, and a quick note that there was supposed to be an eighth transportation funding initiative uh, that was passed by legislature uh, in a previous year that was gonna go on this ballot. Uh, they've decided they want to punt that to 2021 and assuming the governor signs that law, um, there will not be that transportation funding uh, ballot initiative. Um, but we're still, we still have uh, 14 initiatives that are gathering signatures. They have until August 3rd uh, in most cases. And then there's another 18 that could theoretically get put out for signature gathering that would still have that August 3rd deadline. Um, and then two ballot initiatives that have uh, been out and then have either failed or withdrawn. And so um, one of the tricky things this year is, of course, COVID-19. And so the governor has issued an executive order um, 
making it possible for individuals to uh, virtually sign a petition. Um, so if you see a ballot initiative that you're interested in, go to their website, they will um, probably very prominently uh, include a place on their website where you can sign their petition virtually. Um, it may require printing out the petition and signing it and mailing it back. Um, but uh, we're not going to see as many people standing on street corners with uh, clipboards asking for signatures this year. So um, some of the issues that we, uh, we think architects will be interested in. Uh, the first one is a not very exciting name, but repeal property tax assessment rates amendment. Uh, this is going to be a constitutional amendment. This was not started by uh, citizens. This was actually started by the state legislature this year. And so Colorado is a unique state in that we have what's called the Taxpayer Bill of Rights. And one of the most important provisions of that is that the state legislature can't raise taxes without getting permission from the voters. Um, that's not what this initiative is directly about. That's gonna come into play. Uh, we have another constitutional amendment that's called the Gallagher Amendment that was passed in the early 80s. And what that did is said, um, residential property tax revenue can't be more than 45% of the total property tax revenue in the state. The intent was to make sure that um, commercial taxes were not, uh, commercial properties were not undertaxed compared to residential. Uh, and so this has been in place for decades. Now, um, again, with COVID-19, what what's going to happen is that um, with the economic hit associated with COVID-19, um, commercial taxes, property taxes are going to go down. This is a given. Um, whether, you know, how close we are to the correct estimates is kind of still, you know, being worked out, but we know they're gonna go down, they're gonna go down a lot. That means residential property taxes also have to go down because residential property taxes can't outweigh the commercial. Um, and so, that means that there is going to be a lot of local funding for things like schools uh, that's not going to exist uh, based on the current uh, constitution. Um, the current prediction is $500 million shortfall for K-12 education across the state. And then because of Tabor, um, even if we accepted that shortfall this year, um, we wouldn't be able to go back and raise taxes to make it up in the future without uh, voters giving permission to do so. So um, this amendment would remove the Gallagher Amendment and to make it such that um, we're not going to automatically lower taxes on residential property taxes that would have to be raised again in the future. Uh, this is going to preserve the state's ability to collect those tax dollars. Um, going on to the citizen initiative uh, items, um, I think the biggest one, which is still gathering signatures, um, is going to be the graduated income tax initiative. Colorado is a flat tax state, 4.63% for everyone. Um, what this would do is it create tax brackets, um, uh, and those wouldn't start until uh, income is above $250,000. And then it could go up to uh, an 8.9% rate at the high end. Now, part of this uh, initiative is that the money, at least 50% of the tax revenue that will be collected in the future. Uh, so the idea is that people making under 250,000 would have their tax rate lowered. It would be offset by higher earners. Um, there is anticipated to be additional revenue because of this. Half of that will have to go to public education. And there's some additional rules beyond that. But that's the big takeaway. So um, if you're voting in favor of this, you're not just voting for tax brackets to be added to the Constitution. You are also voting for the requirement uh, on how those taxes have to be spent. Now, uh, conservatives in the state um, don't want, in general, don't want tax brackets. And a particular group has, re has introduced a competing uh, constitutional amendment that would simply reduce the tax rate to 4.55%. That's it. That's all they're doing. Um, that is going to have a big effect on, on revenue. Um, they're still gathering signatures. Um, to be honest, they don't really care if that wins so long as the income uh, tax bracket initiative also fails. So this was introduced deliberately to muddy the waters. So. Um, do your, you know, whether or not you want to raise taxes on certain people or lower taxes for everyone, uh, we're not going to tell you what to do there. But 
um, know that these are competing initiatives and that is by design of, of the uh, people who introduced the one that would lower the tax rate. So um, look at them both together when you're filling out your ballot this November. Uh, a couple other issues that are hot button topics uh, in Colorado regarding oil and gas. Um, there's another initiative that's still gathering signatures um, that's intended to protect current safety rules regarding oil and gas. Um, we have a state commission uh, that um, has some real restrictions on it now based on a previously passed uh, ballot initiative. Uh, but the proponents of this new initiative want to make sure that the safety requirements for, you know, the environment, air quality, uh, et cetera, et cetera, those can't get weakened by that commission. And then also uh, Colorado's big natural gas state. Um, this, uh, this other item gathering signatures would make it so that the state legislature can't pass laws to limit the installation of new natural gas um, lines to different kinds of properties. So, you know, a lot, natural gas is cheap. A lot of homes use natural gas. A lot of our buildings HVAC systems use natural gas. There is a kind of a broader movement to look at electrification of some of these, um, uh, these uh, building components because as we do more renewable energy sources, um, you know, we can uh, reduce carbon overall if we're using renewable energy to power electrical appliances and HVAC systems. Um, so not sure the, law, the odds of either of these getting on the ballot, but I, I think these are of uh, interest to our members. Uh, last two items I want to go over, uh, paid medical and family leave. This has been um, worked on in the state legislature for the last two years, championed by Faith Winter uh, in the Senate in particular. Um, they, the legislature has not been able to come to a consensus on what would be a fair statewide family leave policy. So um, it's been very close to being introduced the past couple sessions, but um, the votes just weren't there. Um, so uh, proponents of this idea that the state should require minimum medical and family leave have decided, have decided to go the signature gathering route. They are still gathering signatures, um, but this would require medical and family leave. And um, employee wages, uh, there would be a deduction on your uh, pay stub uh, to cover these, uh, cover this leave, um, but there would be shared costs between employers and employees. Um, I think it's worth everyone's, uh, to everyone's benefit to read through the entire um, ballot initiative, whether or not you want to sign uh, to get it on the ballot or whether or not we're voting for it in November. Um, Family leave is a big complicated subject, uh, whether or not, you know, even if you feel that strongly that we should have paid uh, medical and family leave, uh, the devil's in the details. So we wanna make sure that um, it's, a, it's a fair system. Uh, there's, if this makes it to the ballot, there's gonna be a lot more in the news about it. So um, keep an eye out for that uh, as, as we look at uh, how the numbers are gonna shake out on um, what the costs are actually going to be if this makes it to the ballot. Uh, and then finally, some good news. Um, a lot of our members have heard about Lakewood's um, effort last year to limit residential growth in their city to 1%. Um, this is terrible for architects. This is terrible um, because, if, if, you know, one, uh, it takes away work from us, and two, it pushes up housing prices which um, for existing housing, which has a lot of negative implications as well. Um, there was an attempt to kind of create a uh, front range wide 1% growth limit um, with the ability for other counties to kind of opt into that. Um, this was looking to be successful. It gathered enough signatures, um, but uh, based on um, funding, uh, the proponents decided to pull this uh, from the 2020 ballot seeing it as too, too high a bar to reach in 2020. So, so we will not be faced with the choice to limit growth in Col residential growth in Colorado. Um, but this has been an issue that's been, on, that's been on ballot initiatives in the past and we expect to see it again in the future. So um, won't be on your ballot in 2020, but it will potentially be on future ballots. All right, and that is uh, my grand summary of the ballot initiatives on, that we're looking at uh, in 2020 that may affect the architecture profession.
All right. Back to you, Aaron. Great. Thanks. Thanks, Nick. Um, I think for the let, let's take a deeper look into steps that architects can um, make to make a difference. Um, I think what uh, we're going to ask Jerry um, a little bit about having about, about the importance of having allies at the Capitol. Um, and Jerry, when I'm remembering um, a year or two ago, going with you to a morning session um, where we had the opportunity to um, meet our state senator uh, or house representative. I think I went to two events with you. Um, I had the opportunity to meet Faith Winner face to face and hear from her as she was seeking reelection. And then um, also my um, uh, House Representative, he's on the, the ballot this year and I voted for him and I returned my ballot. So I'm, my, my duty's done for the primary, um, Kyle Mullica. So um, tell, tell us a little bit about your perspective, uh, why that's important. You bet, Aaron. thank you very much. So I get to discuss the burning question in everyone's mind, how can I get to know and cultivate <laughs> a relationship with my state legislator? But before we get to the how, I think we should talk about the why. Relationships are at the heart of our activity at the Capitol and our ability to be successful. Obviously, your lobbyist plays a role in the process of building relationships and brings my own relationships to the table. But relationships that AIA Colorado as an organization has with legislators and the relationships that individual architects have or can develop with their own legislators are part of developing a complete package as well. So relationships are important because one, they are a source of intelligence. Legislators instinctively want to protect their friends. And so they let us know if someone has a bill that might be adverse to our interests. I can tell you that it is really helpful to get an early heads up about such a bill from an elected friend. So for example, earlier this year, I organized a meeting for Mike and Nick and me to meet with the House Majority Leader, Alec Garnett, both to introduce Mike who was new at that time and to talk about our important issues during the session. During the meeting, Alec Garnett looked at us and said, you ought to take a look at the arbitration bill coming from the Senate. It will remove your ability to require arbitration in contract disputes. That early heads up led to our opposition to the bill, Nick's testimony in committee, and the sponsor ultimately dropping parts of the bill that were anathema to the design construction industry. Now it happens that Nick lives in Representative Garnett's district, goes to his town hall meetings, supports him financially. So shamelessly, I piggybacked on Nick's relationship a number of years ago and invited Representative Garnett before he was the majority leader and before he will become the speaker in January to participate in a panel at an AIA Colorado hosted national speak up conference here three or four years ago. We also invited Crisanta Duran to present at that conference who was then the speaker of the house and the Senate majority leader, Chris Holbert. Representative Garnett actually told the story in the meeting about how he met Nick and, and Nick developed that relationship with him. Number two, relationships are important because your friends can help you fix problems in bills. This year, Representative Shannon Bird was carrying a bill that we flagged as interfering with the role that our licensing board plays in deciding who gets a license to practice in Colorado. So the intent was good. They wanted to fast track the influx of professionals from out of state 
and make the uh, transition to Colorado licenses uh, easier for them. So I went to Representative Byrd and I said, Shannon, we've got a problem. And she said, we will get that fixed. So before we knew it, she had convened a meeting with the sponsor, with Dora and with us, and we actually, uh, we actually fill, fixed that bill. Third, your friends will speak up to you in the caucus. So I think you know that before the action actually takes place in committee or on the floor, the individual caucuses get together in what's supposed to be an open meeting, but often is not, to discuss how their caucus ought to take a position on a bill. They know, the sponsor knows, if he or she is carrying a bill, do I have the support of my own Democrats or my own Republican? So a number of years ago, Sen Senator Andy Kerr, now running for Jeffco County Commissioner, was a champion of green schools issues. We identified a young architect named Jared Minter as our expert on green schools and took him in to meet with the Senator. From that time on, Jared was his go-to architect. And when AIA had any issue on any bill, we could go to Senator Kerr and he would address it in the caucus before it ever got into committee. Four, your friends will carry your bills. One of the best cultivation stories that I wanna share with you today took place a number of years ago around our relationship with Representative Millie Hamner. Millie had developed a great relationship with a number of architects during her tenure at the Capitol. She got close to the Heidi Hoff and to uh, Chris Green. Well, one day I got a call from Chris who asked me, this was Millie's first run at office, do you wanna meet her? So I drove to Vail, Chris and I took her to lunch and we developed just a great start of a relationship. But the creme de la creme was a project we orchestrated to lock in that relationship. Located in Millie's district was the Barney Ford Museum in Breckenridge. Ford was a former slave who became an entrepreneur in Breckenridge, owning a hardware store and a hotel among other ventures. One day, Mary and I had the grandkids doing our tour of Breckenridge and we went into the museum and I discovered, lo and behold, the museum did not have a replica of the state capitol window of Barney Ford. So we sipped our friend Jared Minter on developing a replica and um, uh, Chris Green and uh, Mike Wisniewski and I worked with the local historical society to schedule an event, a reception at the Barney Ford Museum. At that reception, we had Millie Hamner present the replica window to the museum. And the next day on the newspaper, front page picture of Millie, front page story about this great addition to the, to the museum, Barney Ford Museum uh, in, in Breckenridge. Five, your friends, oh, I want to finish the uh, Millie story, I almost forgot. This is really important. So that year, after uh, Millie was elected, uh, we had a sunset go up. And Millie Hamner literally elbowed the sponsor of the bill out of the way and took over as the prime house sponsor. Raleigh Heath from Boulder was our prime Senate sponsor, but Millie would not do anything for the engineers, anything for the land surveyor, unless AIA Colorado said, it's okay with us. Five, your well, friends will help you kill bad bills. The late Karen Harris is a great example. She raised her kids in Aurora with other young moms like Peggy Kern, Suzanne Williams, and Nancy Todd. 
Karen and D.A. Bertram were the biggest roadblocks to the licensure of interior designers in Colorado. And one year, Suzanne Williams was the swing vote in the Senate to either pass or kill the bill. Karen and I took Suzanne to lunch. She looked me right in the eye and she said, if Karen wants to kill that bill, it is dead. Finally, when they grow up and become committee chairs and serve in leadership, like Leroy Garcia and Alec Garnett, they control the action, which committees a bill goes to, when a bill is scheduled for hearing, whether committee members of their own party on the floor will follow their lead, when the bill is heard on the floor, when, whether a floor amendment will be allowed and encouraged or discouraged. Over the decades, we've had a legion of architects who've had great relationships with their own legislators and who have developed them uh, with our help. John Rogers, the R in RNL before it became Stancy, with Senator Al Nicholjohn in the 1980s, all the way up to the relationship that Paul Hutton and Alan Ford have with Senator Jim uh, Smallwood, to the relationship that Paul and Kevin Aronis and Deborah Lucking are building with Senator Chris Hansen right now. I hope you will mark your calendars to join Senator Hansen, Paul, Kevin, and Deborah on a sustainability town hall next Wednesday, July 1st at 4 p.m. It is a program that we hope to replicate with other architects and legislators around the state. So the final piece of this, of course, is you. And we want to encourage every AIA member first, if you have a relationship with your state legislator, tell us. <laughs> tell Nick, we want to be able to leverage that relationship with on behalf of AIA Colorado. But we can also help you develop that relationship. So now I'm going to tell you how easy this is, so pay attention. <laughs> if you don't know your legislator or want to meet him or her, make a note right now that says, call Jerry. <laughs> I will take you to lunch with your legislator or a candidate and pick up the tab. Rachel Johnson took me up on that just two years ago. We had a great lunch with Representative Alec Valdez running for his first term. Since that time, Representative Valdez has been named to the Capital Development Committee, elected by his freshman class to represent the class in leadership meetings. And we've had him down to the AIA offices to meet with a group of architects. During that meeting, we learned this gem of information. If the governor and the Capital Development Committee have two projects in front of it and can only fund one, the project with the electric vehicle charging stations will get the appropriation. This is so easy. Here are the steps. Call Jerry, come to lunch, ask the legislator to put you on his or her mailing list. Attend a town hall meeting or two or three. Engage in the candidate's campaign. Take half a day on Saturday to knock on doors with the candidate. Make a small contribution, $25 to $50 in the candidate's campaign will do it. If you really get engaged, host an event, get your neighbors together at a local brew pub for a beer with the candidate on a Wednesday evening, or organize a Saturday morning coffee with your neighbors and let their kids run around the backyard while you're talking to the candidate about what they believe and what their issues are. And finally, invite the candidate to a meeting at AI Colorado. So we did that earlier with Senator Faith Weber, Representatives Yadira Caraveo, Kyle Mullica, and Shannon Bird. And guess what, guys? Next year, each of the four of them will chair a committee at the state capitol.
Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Jerry. Yeah, so I think uh, the, the underlying message is uh, we can make simple steps. I think I, you know, uh, if, if, if Jerry can take you uh, and, and facilitate that discussion with your representative and, and um, grease, the, grease the skids, whatever we need, um, that, that would be helpful. Um, so Nick, you and I are going to kind of wrap it up here with some some more steps or, you know, steps we can all make, yep. all take to make a difference. Um, Jerry touched on uh, the elected officials um, and, and the people that we, that represent us in the House and, um, and Senate. Um, everyone has 10. Talk about that. Oh, so, sure. So, um, you know, if, if you think about it, you, you have as, someone who lives in Colorado. You have a state um, representative, state senator. You've got, you know, there's, there's governor, there's, uh, you have one U.S. Um, representative, you have two senators. Um, you have, so that's six right there. Those are kind of the big ones. Um, there's some other positions too that are statewide, secretary of state treasurer. Um, they represent everyone. Um, you've got local representatives. You probably had, you know, you have a mayor, you have a city council member. Um, you probably have a county commissioner. Um, so like there's all these layers of, of elected officials where you know, we talk a lot about state legislature because that's where the most action happens that affects the architecture profession as a whole in Colorado. Um, but, but relationships at every level, if you can make them are great. You know, we have, uh, you know, it's, uh, People who start out in local government are going to be the ones who end up making it into the state legislature. So, you know, you, some people go from the private sector straight to the state legislature, but a lot of people are, have been on city councils or they've been mayor and then they kind of move on up to something new uh, or they, they, they make a lateral move uh, from, say, state representative to county commissioner. Uh, so, you know, making a relationship at any level is a good opportunity whether or not we know that's going to be a particularly strategic one for the organization, it doesn't matter. Uh, if you have the relationships, uh, there will come a time when we can probably uh, leverage that to, to help out the architecture profession. So. Yeah, good. I, th I think the underlying uh, idea though is that you, if we as architects are advocating for our clients every day, if we can uh, spin and, and um, advocate for each other in architecture um, and, or whatever issue that we feel passionate about, um, we can have AIA, AIA, AIA help us do that. Um, and just uh, choosing who we, we support and being uh, informed about those decisions um, with uh, advocacy issue organizations or nonprofit organizations. Um, we, we need to uh, choose who we can support. Uh, and then some low time commitment options that we, we can point to. Um, we talked about the website, find your elected officials website. And, yeah, but let, let um, me show everyone how yeah. simple that is. <laughs> um, so it just takes a um, minute. It really does. So first of all, on our website, calendar, AIAColorado.org, um, you will find a calendar item for that July 1st event with, Sen with Senator Hansen. So this is one of his town halls. Uh, can be featuring three architects. So go to the website, send me an email, I will send you that Zoom information. We would love to have a ton of architects listening in to a senator's regularly scheduled town halls. That makes a big difference. Um, I think, uh, you know, it, it's a senator that we have a lot in common with. Senator Hansen runs a lot of sustainability bills. We have uh, formally supported uh, one of those bills this year. Um, so, and we expect to do more in the future. Um, so whether or not you live in Denver um, or, you know, if you're interested in just kind of glimpsing into this process and helping us uh, with an hour of your time, uh, attend this town hall next, uh, next Wednesday at 4 p.m. Go to our website uh, for more details. Uh, but in terms of how easy it is to find um, your legislature, legislator, uh, just Google Colorado find my legislator and let me bring up the chat. 
Um, oh, it doesn't like it when I share screens. Um, but basically, you know, ledge.colorado.gov, find my legislator. Easy to find with a Google search. Um, put in your address. And I'm just going to use the AIA Colorado address uh, just as an illustration. So look, boom, it's that simple. Uh, we know who our, I know who my representative is. I know who my senator is. All right, so the next step. Well, who are these people? So if you, um, uh, if you click on the photo for website here, you're going to get taken to their state uh, profile. That's, gonna, that, that's managed by the state. It's going to list the bills they support and the communities they're on, so you can learn a little bit about what they're doing. But that's not their campaign website. Uh, that's not their personal website. So you, you have to Google that. But it's real uh, simple. So Alec Garnett, Colorado House, now that I know who it is, um, you know, the ledge.colorado.gov is going to be that official one. But if you look, you know, if you scroll on the list, it'll probably be second or third is the second. Um, Senator Gonzalez is uh, fourth. But, you know, you'll find their, uh, their campaign websites. And so uh, the easy things that everyone can do. So that took, what, five minutes, if that? probably two. Um, you have all the, you have everything you need. Um, you can donate to the campaign. Uh, you can sign up for newsletters. Uh, you can check them out on social media. And so, yeah, the newsletters are going to put you on a mailing list. And I know that everyone's on a million mailing lists. But um, like everyone else, legislators, you know, there's only so many ways a legislator can connect with their constituents. And if they have events coming up, it's going to be in their newsletter. So, uh, I think the, you know, these legislator uh, mailing lists, whether you're a supporter or not, if you live in their district, you are a constituent, um, you, you get to interact with your, with your legislators. Um, you, get to, you can call them up if you have opinions or questions. Um, get on that mailing list and figure out when they're having events. Um, you can also follow them on social media. So, you know, if you have a Facebook account, that way you're not getting like emails, but they'll still post their events on Facebook. If they're on Instagram, they'll post them on Instagram. Uh, one quick caveat, um, uh, and Julie Gonzalez is a good example of this. So uh, Senator Gonzalez ran for election in 2018. She's not up this year. So her campaign website is not super up to date. Uh, if you click on the Facebook link, um, it's not available because it was her campaign Facebook page. Um, but if you go back uh, to the Google search, uh, you will see right here, she does have a Facebook page as a senator. So, um, you know, it might take uh, one extra step to make sure you're, you're following uh, your legislators, but um, still very easy to do. Uh, and I really want to emphasize the importance of making contribution. Um, if you make a, you know, and They'll have recommended amounts, but if you want to give ten dollars, give ten dollars. Um, that you know, they'll they'll see who made those contributions. And as you start to, you know, go to events, have conversations, uh, you don't have to remind them, hey, I'm a con you know, I'm a contributor. Listen to me. It's not really about that, but it's just kind of creating all those touch points of recognizing your name, recognizing your face, um, knowing that you care enough to to make time to listen to what your legislators have to say. Um, doesn't matter again. Doesn't matter if you voted for them or not. You don't have to be a diehard supporter, but they appreciate input from constituents. Um, they're not. They know they're not experts on everything. Um, a lot of our legislators who are really bright people know nothing about the way the architecture profession really works. And so being able to kind of bring that experience to uh, the table uh, in town halls or whatnot is great. Um, uh, an example for me, uh, my senator is uh, Robert Rodriguez. And Senator Rodriguez, and I'll go into more detail next week, uh, ran a bill to um, make it easier to sue architects for construction defects. Um, thankfully, that bill did not pass. But, you know, I've supported uh, Senator Rodriguez. Um, I've uh, testified in front of his committee. Um, I went to a town hall earlier this year and said, hey, uh, you know, there were like, there were 12 of us at this town hall. Um, you know, thousands of people in his district and 12 people made the time to show up to an in-person event. And I said, hey, you know, uh, this bill is problematic. Here's, here's why. And the Senator said, let's talk a little bit more after the meeting. And so I was able to give him a little more in-depth detail. And unfortunately, I couldn't change his mind. Um, and that's okay. Um, he appreciated that I had a, you know, a well-reasoned um, 
explanation for why I didn't like the bill and why it was bad for my profession. Um, and I, you know, he, he said flat out, he appreciated knowing more about the issue than he did before. And so, you know, it was, it was a win and that the bill didn't pass. It wasn't a win that we weren't able to convince him at that time that it was the wrong bill to run. Um, but, you know, it, these relationships matter because I can go to another town hall uh, in the future. And if he's running a bill that I like, I will, I, I have an opportunity to tell him, hey, this is a good bill um, or have future conversations on construction defect bills. So um, a lot of easy things we can do, um, you know, even if you can never make it to a town hall, get on those mailing lists, um, throw a few bucks at your legislator and, you know, you will at least have a better understanding of uh, what's important to them. And then you can find opportunities where you might be able to offer insight in the future. Um, another uh, avenue for getting involved um, is through uh, the political parties. And so it's, it's not just about legislators themselves. Uh, Denver in, particu in particular has a really strong infrastructure for both the Democrats and Republicans. Every House district has monthly meetings that are open to the public. Uh, if you go to these meetings, you will find out a whole lot about what people care about in your district. And again, um, you know, they're not necessarily thinking about the world of architecture, but we, you know, we know a lot uh, uh, on a lot of subjects that we can contribute to these conversations. And so go to, uh, go to your uh, political party's monthly meeting. Um, should be easy to find on the internet and, you know, pay attention to what's going on. And, you know, that's a great way to kind of make a quick introduction to your legislators. State legislators often attend these meetings. Um, they can't always stay for the whole thing, uh, but um, these are regular interactions to connect with people. Um, you might get roped into doing things like being a precinct committee person, which is actually a really big time commitment of going out and getting people to vote in your neighborhood. Um, so, you know, the, make the right decision for what you have time to do, but you can find out some really interesting things uh, through your political party. Like uh, I found out uh, earlier this week that the chair of my house district for the Democratic Party uh, is married to an AIA fellow. So I uh, had, had a conversation with her because I volunteered to be a precinct committee person told her what I did. She's like, oh, I'm, I'm married to a fellow. So like there's all these opportunities where you can make connections and realize that, yeah, yeah architects are doing a lot. Um, and there's a, a lot of opportunities. So um, let me share the screen. Or let me, sorry, get back to the summary. So kind of uh, to wrap it all up. Um, all right. So you can support elected officials, um, political parties. Uh, I, I like your point about, yeah, don't, if you're trying to make a relationship, uh, don't just call and complain. Uh, we're, yeah, we're, we're having um, a dialogue. Yeah, but, yeah, but it's about listening. It's listening, it really. Yep. And, and paying attention, and that gets recognized. And then when there is something that you want to speak about, speak up about, that makes it easier to do right. so. Right. Um, so other, other ways to get involved, um, if you're not sure about your elected official or they're, they're not your political party, but there they are, you know, where do you, where do you want to put your efforts? Um, you know, there's a lot of issue and advocacy organizations, a lot of nonprofit organizations that, um, that, that uh, appreciate uh, financial support. Uh, they're looking for volunteers. Many of them do have an advocacy arm themselves. So, um, some of them are, are less political, uh, but are still trying to go out and make a difference in the world. So those are totally fair game too. If, if that's where your passions lie, go, go out, get involved in those. Um, but again, sign up for mailing lists, uh, follow people or organizations on social media, um, pay attention to the news. Um, I know we're all busy, um, but you know, look, for, look for opportunities to read about what your legislators are doing. Um, make, you know, try to make some time to get involved. Uh, and then I want to end on two really important, well, one really important uh, subject is kind of bolded there on the bottom left, make a campaign contribution or make a contribution to ARCPAC or uh, ARCAPAC. So um, legislators rely on, you know, contributions to fund their campaigns. And so we're not buying votes, but we're, you know, supporting candidates that we want to see win, they need money from people. Um, they are looking for money from people and, and happy to accept money from organizations in most cases. Uh, if we're not 
making contributions um, other people are who might not have the interest of the architecture profession uh, in mind. So, you know, if we're not active, we're still going to be subject to the final results. So, uh, I really want to draw attention to ARCPAC, which is a Colorado political committee, which is our version of a PAC. Um, you know, these are not big dollar amounts, but they matter. You know, individuals or your firms can, can contribute up to $575 per election cycle. Um, and then uh, ARCPAC will look for candidates that um, align, that have aligned interests with us, and we will support those candidates, usually with one to $200 checks, uh, up to $400. Um, the more we can bring in, the more, more contributions we can make. Um, but, you know, we are looking for candidates across the state in both political parties because our membership is varied. Um, so we want to have good representation uh, of our membership. Uh, we want to, we, we stick to um, issues that affect the architectural profession. Uh, we don't get to control who has the majorities in the House or the Senate or who, who the governor is, but we want to be able to work with everyone um, on issues that are important to the architectural profession. So, so we do specifically look at um, positions of legislators uh, to support, and we, we do make it a point to be nonpartisan or bipartisan and look for those legislators across the state. And then um, we don't talk a lot about it in Colorado, but AIA National has their own PAC called ARCHIPAC. Um, go to archipac.org, um, log in with your AIA account, and you can make a contribution to ARCHIPAC. They support U.S. House and U.S. Senate candidates. Um, these are also important relationships to build. Uh, the um, National takes, takes the lead on this, but you know, they need the same support that we need here. So even if you are totally strapped for time, um, we hope that you can make a contribution to help support our organization's efforts to build these relationships and see uh, candidates that uh, succeed where their, in their interests align with the architecture profession. And that wraps it up. Excellent. So I, is the next step, um, Will Mike be taking questions from? Uh, our see if we have any questions. Well, hi guys. Uh, nice job. I, I updated my wardrobe with all this great information. <laughs> you voted? I do exactly hi. what I had to say about the issues. So uh, thanks for sharing that insight. And you heard it here, folks, first uh, Jerry's predictions on the, on the uh, legislative makeup. So um, yeah. We're not gonna we're not gonna ask people to place their bets, but uh, no. we know where the where the good insight lies. So thanks for sharing that as well. Um, this is the ultimate people business politics is. So it should come as no surprise that that relationships are the currency in which uh, the policy derives from. Um, and just a couple stories I want to use to underscore what was said. Um, this is a white hat organization because of the people that are in it. Um, I couldn't really use that analogy very much back in the Midwest, but it certainly applies here. People know what I'm talking about. Um, and there are some black hat people who would have to use other tools in their toolbox uh, to get the jobs on, which is mostly money and uh, power and influence. Our influence derives from the kind of people we are. There's not that many folks who a politician, someone in public life deals with on a daily basis that aren't a little bit off or a little bit agitated so when a rational and solutions oriented person who's a professional that wants to be of service uh, enters into their conversation, they love it. And when you offer to help them, either by spending some time with them on the campaign trail or giving them some money, it is the ultimate vulnerability for a person to publicly put themselves out for rejection or approval. So when someone comes and says, I stand with you, that goes a long way. And it doesn't take a lot either. Um, in a former life, I was a campaign person. I was the uh, communications director for legislative campaigns. At the end of the campaign, we would uh, look at all the money that came in, either the mailbox or overnight through the website. And that's what I had to work with because then I had to go out. Well, the first thing I did was I looked at all the ads that our opponent had bought in the last 24 hours, mm -hmm. uh, radio, TV, newspaper, and try and match it. Mm -hmm. I would match based on how much money came in. And I knew exactly who gave what. Uh, and I would mention any amount 
from $10 and up to my candidate. And we were able to buy 40 more cable ads a day because all these people who gave you money. So it made an impression. And then when people would come in the door and say, I want to volunteer, we'd, we'd say, how much time do you got? If they had any length of time, I'd say two to three hours, we'd say, great, uh, wait for the candidate to come and you'll go walk with them. Because we didn't want to do it, we were busy. <laughs> <laughs> but a person who comes in off the street has two or three hours, will get personal one-on-one -on -one time with the candidate uh, to, to build a relationship. You may not have never met that person before, but now all of a sudden you've got an afternoon with them or a morning with them. So um, it doesn't take a lot, it's easy to do. And the old adage is true, life is run by those who show up. So show up either with uh, a contribution or with your time and it'll make a big difference. Um, the last story, and this is one of my favorite um, two really, we, we did, um, we leveraged our pack whenever possible to we're from the district in front of legislators um, at, a, at a local event. And then it would translate into lobbying experiences at the Capitol. And eventually the majority leader um, would, I was with the treasurer of our board who was someone who had routinely gone to these uh, fundraisers and, and talked to the person once a year. She started to call, we were walking down the street in the, in the or down the hall in the Capitol. Um, and she comes out of the chamber and says, my architect. <laughs> <laughs> Engage him in any work as an architect, but it was on any issue about design and construction, that was her source. She knew that this is my person that I can ask any question. If I don't know what to think about a bill, I'm gonna call my architect. So that's when you know you've had success is when um, their secretary or legislative assistant will slide a note across the desk and for whatever that person's busy doing and they'll say, oh, my architect, I'm going to talk to Amy. I'm going to drop what I'm doing because I appreciate what they have to say. And then finally, the very last one, um, when Barack Obama was a state senator, I would, one of the first experiences I had lobbying him and explain who I was working for, he said, you know, I always wanted to be an architect when I was a kid. And he told this story about um, all the things he used to do as a little kid, but eventually he figured out he wasn't very good at math or drawing and became a lawyer instead. And it was the, um, it, it worked out, he said, it worked out pretty well for me, but um, <laughs> lawyer too. Um, I thought he was just telling me a story. You know, Paul Malik, he probably told the same exact story to the lobbyists, for the doctors and the firemen and the whoever else, right? Well, he runs for president several years later and they have a forum with all the candidates uh, with, um, high school aspiring journalists. This one kid asks all the candidates, what did, if you didn't go into politics, what would you have done instead? And almost word for word, I hear the exact same story from years before. They told me when he first met the lobbyist for the University of Architects as a new legislator from the South Side of Chicago. So that's not an isolated case. Um, it's obviously one of the most well-known people who do that, but you hear that a lot. People respect, admire, um, would like to be architects if they had the talent, skills, and ability to do so. So we are not people who come hat in hand with um, a negative perception. So we've got to take advantage of those opportunities. Yep. All right, that's enough story time for me. <laughs> uh, I don't see any questions, but of course I want to um, invite people to ask questions if they have them. Um, Nick has, uh, I also want to point out to people who are uh, we're following along that there's uh, website links that you can use. Um, they were referenced in the presentation if you want to look at those. And any, uh, without any questions, or while we wait for any to come in, any closing thoughts or reactions to what Allison said? Well, I'm looking forward to the, um, the, the, next Wednesday's um, visit with for the sustainable and I'm, I'm signed up for that and um, Nick or that's at four and then lunchtime um, Nick next week you're talking about the success later recap yep good good the good strangest time. session any of us have ever seen <laughs> yes <Yeah? twists> turns <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> Um, the 
belabor the point here. I just want to say thanks to everybody for your, your contributions today. It was an insightful conversation and one that uh, we can learn from going forward. It's also going to be, uh, it has been recorded and made available uh, down the road for people that want to see it. If you know someone who would really benefit from hearing this content, um, and we we'll probably come back to it as the year goes on, because I, I don't think um, the things we talked about today are going to be any less relevant as we approach November. So we hope this will be a resource going forward over the next few months as people think about uh, how to vote and how to get more involved. And of course, there's always time and room for people who want to get involved in the Architecture Advocates Network. Um, so Nick and uh, this crew are who to talk to about doing that. And then you've got your instructions to call Jerry. <laughs> <laughs> Written down. <laughs> I am happy to connect anyone with Jerry as well. Well, thanks everybody for joining us today. And uh, as Nick mentioned earlier, we have uh, more sessions coming up in the future. I think the one that uh, is probably most relevant to our conversation today is where we switch gears and go, instead of talking about some of the political landscape, we talk about the policy landscape and, and all the activities we were engaged in this session. Um, even though it was an unusual time for the politicians to gather and try and get things done, they still did a heck of a lot. And we were right there in the trenches um, up until, I will say, um, with pride and accuracy, the very last minutes of <laughs> we're either the second to last bill or the third to last bill on the calendar in both chambers. Um, right. Something that we were able to be victorious on. So um, stay tuned for that. We've got some great stories to share with our members and the work we did on your behalf. So hope to see you next time and have a great rest of the week.